Clicker check? Yeah. Baby check. <laughs> I did this last year and the year before, and I think I always do this to start with a kid's slide. I've been busy. This is me on my way to Spain with a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I go to Barcelona once a year to teach a class, a digital marketing class in, uh, yeah, which is Barcelona, one of the greatest cities in the world. And, uh, and it's an honor and it's fun, but, to, but the eight-hour flight on the way there, the nine-hour flight on the way back, when the one-year-old can't go anywhere except this little space, she just doesn't understand. But um, let's break the ice with a picture of Ada. That's Ada. Okay, uh, I'm a, I've been doing uh, SEO for 18 years and analytics just as long. I've been doing content strategy for about 11 years. Uh, I, I've been teaching a content strategy framework that I'm excited by, and Hope asked me to adapt it a bit more for the B2C audience, so here it is. Um, it's, I'm calling this the 1% content strategy because it is literally a combination of tactics which are so rarely used that if you put them all together, you're going to be in the top 1%. You're literally going to be using a combination of tactics that is uh, going to help you beat 99% of other content strategies. You're going to see at the end how I do that math and break that down. I think it's widely misunderstood how content works. The way that they make it sound, if you read millions of the blogs out there, is that write an article and people will find or for share or read or open that article. And then some percentage of those people are going to go from that article to a service page because they just realized they needed your help. Then they go to read the about page where they trust you and learn about what you believe and then they go to the contact page and the conversion, the thank you page. It's definitely true that digital marketing is about building a bridge from google.com to your thank you page or facebook.com to your thank you page. But I think this arrow is just not that common. It's very unlikely that a visitor will go from your blog post to your service page because that's just not why we visited that blog post. That's not why people go to, to read articles. It might be true that if you put, I made a segment for blog landers, people who start their visit on a blog post, it might be true that a lot of, a lot of people are attracted to that content, but the percentage of those people who take action, the conversion rate, abysmally low, like unbelievably low. It's just that it almost never happens. It's very unlikely that a visitor who reads your content marketing or comes to your article is ever going to convert into a lead because they don't have commercial intent. They have information intent, not commercial intent. In fact, if you make another, another uh, segment for people who start their visit on a service page, I call them service page landers, compared to people who start their visit on a blog post, blog landers, it's literally like 50x. In other words, visitors who start their visit on a service page, they have commercial intent. They are 50 times as likely to turn into a lead, to convert, to need your services than a visitor who starts just by reading an article. So it's rare that that happens. But what is not rare is that people do link to blog posts all the time. Go to Search Console, click on the links. Where is it? Links. And you'll see that the content that gets linked to is the blogs, blog, 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 blog. People almost never, equally weird would be people linking to a service page. People don't share ads, link to ads, or subscribe to ads, right? <laughs> it's just very unlikely. But people do link to articles. And, and so maybe this is the real mechanism that is the key to creating demand, the key to our content strategy, is we have this blog content. We have this helpful, useful stuff because it gives the world something to link to. Those links pass authority, and that authority makes everything on your domain more likely to rank, makes the service page more likely to rank, because even if you get a gazillion visitors to read these blog posts, what we're really trying to do is to get this page to rank, because qualified visitors to this page are very likely to convert. In this little framework I'm making up here, I'm going to have or, um, blue means content marketing pages, and red means sales pages. So that's maybe the real key. Maybe that's the, how we can uh, create a consistent amount of demand. This is exactly how I did it. We are a $4.5 million company, 36 people, 18 years in business, zero money spent on advertising. 100% based on this exact strategy, right? Getting the service page, the home page, the sales page to rank. So there's really two kinds of visitors to websites. In fact, we are all two types of people when we, when we use the internet. We have either commercial intent, we're transactional, or we have information intent. We're just looking for answers. We're just kicking tires. We're just getting DIY type information. We want to solve our problems ourselves. Research will show us that there's eight times as many key phrases for the information intent queries, right? I call those question marks. Only 10% of all queries are commercial intent. They call those dollar signs. So with that in mind, we have to understand that ultimately we have two kinds of pages on our websites. There are two types of URLs on each of your websites. There's the, the, the sales pages, the product pages, the service page, the pages optimized to rank for the commercial intent, the, the dollar sign key phrase. 
Then there's the helpful, useful mini version of Wikipedia, the magazine, all the content marketing stuff we publish. And this stuff is great because visitors might subscribe to it, grow brand awareness, they might follow you, better search traffic or social, and they might link. And those links are what makes the entire domain more likely to rank, helping this page rank because when these people search and find you, they are farther down in the bottom of the funnel they have, they're more likely to become a lead. Okay, so this is gonna be the mechanism that I'm gonna use to create a steady stream of demand. I wanna wake up in the morning and have leads, that's my goal, right? I don't have, I'm not cold calling people, I don't have an ad budget. So this is gonna be my strategy, which I think is just kind of a fancy word. In my mind, I replace it when I hear people say strategy. I'm just gonna call that a plan to reach a goal. I'm not an MBA, but is there, a, we'll go with that, okay? And content strategy, really what's that? It's just a plan to use content to reach your business goal. Good enough. That's, I don't like buzzwords. I'm always trying to use shorter, simpler words. Even strategy, it's kind of a buzzword. But this is our plan. Okay, so my B2B example, the, the B2C example that I'm, that I'm adapting this from was about coffee. Uh, I looked up, I was thinking about coffee products, a B2C coffee product. I found this guy. We're not going to use that one, even though, what a charming little product. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to make an office coffee service. If you want coffee, we're going to bring coffee right to your desk in four minutes or less. I'll make that up as my value proposition because we're a speedy bean, okay? I'm going to create a steady stream of demand using a content strategy to create, uh, you know, customers all day long for speedy bean. And step one, always step one in content strategy to publish your mission. Your mission is the reason why people visit. It's the content, mar it's the foundation of your content strategy. Here's mine. We are where who? Digital marketers. Find what? Practical advice on content analytics and web design. Why? Because you want to get better results from your websites, okay? That's who finds what and what's in it for them. I want you all, if you haven't done this yet, to steal this. This is my template for creating your content mission statement. I do this for fun with friends at bars. I pair this with wine. I like this with the red wine. I will sit down with people and actually, it's like I enjoy this. I'm weird that way. Content strategy, we love this stuff, right? Great, let's make this. So it's where audience X gets information Y for benefit Z. If you do this, you are statistically more likely to have strong results in digital, according to the Marketing Profs Content Marketing Institute B2B Marketing Survey, right? You, the people that have no mission statements are very likely to say they're ineffective at their marketing. So you're three times more likely to be effective in marketing just by creating that, do it on a napkin. So everyone does that, right? We all do that, right? Nope, only 28% of brands have even done that. You're already gonna be you know, on your way to being the top 1% by simply taking that extra step. It's not mysterious to me why that is so effective. It actually, I can draw a straight line between that and success because you can turn that thing into your call to action and immediately begin to get better results. This is, this is our blog, this is the header. Why are you on this website? To get practical tips for content marketing, web analytics, and web design. A lot of people's blogs, at the top of the blog, is there's one word with four letters. What does it say? Blog. <laughs> Why would they say that? Isn't marketing about differentiation? They just write blog at the top of their blog. Like, how boring is that? So this is actually, I'm just repurposing my, con this is the information why, right? This is, I'm just repurposing it. The mission statement makes a great call to action to subscribe to help you get started making delicious coffee at home. Have you done this yet? Have you repurposed your content strategy to tell people why they're on your website, what they would get? Give them the why they're here, right? It's the, the purpose of this visit for you, the reason you're here. And you can use this everywhere you have a call to action, but it makes a great call to action no matter where you put it, even in the footer, right? I've got space in my footer to use those few simple words. It's where you get bi-weekly web marketing tips. Yet everywhere on the internet you'll see this. <laughs> Ask yourself, why would someone put their email address in there? Ask yourself, wouldn't it be weird if someone put their email address in there? <laughs> I see these all the time. I mean, that's not a joke. That's not a joke slide. That's a real <laughs> screenshot of an actual website. People do this everywhere. Newsletter, email, subscribe. There's no reason to even do that. Ask yourself, if it's, if it's weird that someone would do the, take the desired action, maybe you've got a problem with conversion. Okay, that, I'm, I'm done making fun of that one. By the way, this also makes great social media profiles. We've got a lot of social media marketers in this, in this group. I just took a screenshot of a bunch of social media profiles of recent followers. Let's take a look. <laughs> let's, take, let's see what, what these people are about. Let's see what I would get if I subscribe. Let's call that a soft subscribe, right? I'm gonna add them to my social stream. Why would I click on that? Well, maybe if that's my thing today, um, that's a, not, I, not an exotic dancing at the moment. 
um, this person has uh, some general topics. That kind of saying who they are. Start back down here. Oh, I, I actually respect this guy. You got you <laughs> something about that. It's very sincere, right? You really know, like he's just just going straight at it, right? He's just being. Uh, this one though, look at this, and this one I actually followed, right? So this is. Um, uh, she's telling me what I would get, right? What am I signing up for? What are I going to put in my stream? She's about improving content quality and reach, right? Great. I see what she's all about. Okay, so here's my Speedy Bean. This took me three minutes. I'm making my content strategy for Speedy Bean. We are where office, Chicago office people find what? Fun tips for the workplace and caffeine. Why? To stay awake, happy, and productive. Done. My content mission statement is done. I set tone. I'm telling them why they're here. I'm going to make it fun. I'm going to make it tips, right? It's going to be about happiness. It's going to, you can already imagine what kind of stuff I would publish. Now I'm going to specifically find the stuff I would publish. Where do I find topics? This is one of my favorite things to do in content strategy, right? Find the topics my audience would love. I'm just going to go to Google and start searching for things as if I'm, going to ser as if I'm looking for topics. Nope. As a searcher, nope. I'm looking for topics. As a content marketer, and here's a huge list of things that I could write about tomorrow rank for next week. It take, if I type the next letter of the alphabet, it's going to show me a bunch more, right? But it's boring to do that 26 times. So I'll just go to uh, keywordtool.io, and it's going to scrape all those out of Google in two seconds. Giant list of topics that align with my content strategy, right? 418 possible topics. Anything here look interesting? Sure, right? How to make coffee less bitter. How to make coffee without a, without a coffee maker. That's going to be hilarious, I can imagine. Let's take a look at this one, answerthepublic.com. Anyone using this yet? Very popular. More hands every year. If you haven't found this yet, get ready. You're, gonna, you're about to go into the, you know, a deep well of ideas. It basically scrapes the internet. I'm not sure what source is. Reddit? Um, Quora? Some, somewhere it looks online and finds a bunch of questions, every question related to a topic. I put in office coffee. Here are the top 15 questions people are asking on the internet about office coffee. And it's in this weird circular infographic -y thing, so you kind of start to turn your head. It's cool at first, then it's annoying, but you can switch it to the list view. Useful, practical, right? Immediately I can tell these are things that my audience might love, that might align with my content strategy. Another great source of topics, one more, is Quora.com. I went to Quora.com and took a screenshot of just all the, all the, you know, basically these are the upvoted ones. These are the ones that are already vetted to be interesting, right, that have been qualified by an audience to be, in, that are, and, and I love this so much because not only is it the topic, but if you click into this, the question, it's going to give you a bunch of answers. There's my research. And it's going to give you a bunch of people who are relevant to the topic. Those are my possible collaborators. This is like an all-in-one package up. I mean, if you had no other tools, you might just go to Quora.com. You could produce great content all the time that way. And then I'm going to start to fill up my publishing calendar. And as I do, I'm going to kind of keep in mind, this is how I think about it. Every topic in the universe is organized on a giant fractal. And you can zoom in or zoom out and find amazing things at any different depth, right? Like if I'm panned way out, I've got a high-level list post like top 10 office perks. Zoom in, I've got office, office kitchens, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm more deep on that topic. In-depth, detailed post. I think I need to update this because that'd be a very short post, right? That's like a one-word article. That's an easy, <laughs> easy one to add. But you can imagine, right, how these could be, you know, the detailed stuff is often stuff that works well in search. The high-level list post stuff is, uh, might often work in social. They get the idea. But there's one format for content that beats all others. There's one format of content that is consistently outperforms all others. Do you guys know what it is? Research. Original research. Thank you. Because it's not true that good content's good and bad content's not as good. What's true is that good content is amazing and bad content is basically worthless, gets no results at all. Four million blog posts published per day. An average of three and a half hours people put into these blog posts, literally lifetimes of effort every day are being wasted on content that really doesn't get any results. But Steve Rayson found what does get results when he analyzed a million articles, and he found that there's two formats that, uh, that outperform the others. Well, first he finds the scariest hockey stick curve in all of digital. 75% <laughs> of articles get no results at all. No links at all. That's no performance in search. 50% of articles have two or fewer Facebook interactions, which I round down to zero because that's the author and their editor. That's basically nobody, right? That's like me and my mom. So, so, but a tiny, tiny percentage of articles get all the love, get tons of traction. It's, an, it's a case about quality over quantity. I'm going to work way, way harder on my articles because I know that a tiny percentage will get better results. I found this video that I think summarizes well the, the, uh, the argument between quantity and quality. 
We're going to say blue, the guys in blue are the quality, and uh, red is going to be quantity. Ready? This is seriously like, OK, the good blog post, the good content strategy, right? There's thousands of people publishing, you know, pressing the publish button on WordPress, and just a few people who know exactly how to do it, right? They're creating interconnected content. They're con using contributor quotes. They're publishing original research. They're going long form. Look at how many people there are on this field. It's hilarious. Look, they've got like 15 goalies. <laughs> Who's going to win this game? Seriously. <laughs> it's not even a contest. It's not even a contest. That is the quantity versus quality case right there. I think that's the game. That kind of sums it up for me. There's a tiny number of people who are getting, think about it, 0.001% of all pages are on the first page in Google, right? Search for something. 10 gazillion pages are re relevant to this topic. Here are 10. What percentage is that, right? 1% of people have all the YouTube views. 1% of people on Twitter have the largest, you know, get all the, the traction and engagement, right? This is, in, no matter where you look, every curve in digital is a huge, exponential, frightening, exponential curve. But yeah, the difference, what he found is the difference is that there's two things that work that get a consistent high level of both shares and links, <laughs> social and search. Then you should do two things, which is opinion forming authoritative content or well research and evidence content. I paraphrase Steve. A, strong opinions and original research. Rarely will I meet a brand that's ready to consistently create strong opinion content. That takes guts. Anyone here ever written a strong opinion? Anyone here's boss wanted to write strong opinions? Anyone ready to draw a line in the sand and plant a flag and come out against something? Who wants to come out strongly against something in their content? Tough. Good. Stephanie's ready. She's going to do it. The cease and desist. You got legal action? That's great. That's, not, that's, what, that's performance. <laughs> She's wearing a blue shirt. That's how you know. That's a good sign. OK, so look at analytics, and it shows you original research. I showed this a second ago. The different, this is the old, older screenshot. Gets all the links. Here's, what, here's three ways to do it. Observation, aggregation, or the, the survey. I'm going to show you consistent, repeatable, scalable ways to produce original research using examples that I've done. I do this all the time. Do it anytime you want. Observation. We build a website for a client. Website goes live. Client says, uh, where's my search tool? Where's the search tool? We built, you built a website. It should have a search tool, right? Like, eh, not really. Your site map is kind of narrow, kind of shallow. Your navigation is very descriptive. There's no reason to put a search tool on your website. But isn't that standard? Good question. What is standard on websites? Anyone here know the answer? It's not really a known, it's not a good answer. What is standard on websites? So go to Alexa.com, and I've downloaded a list of the, 50, the top 50 marketing websites. Make a list of 10 different website attributes, and I email these two things to a virtual assistant who emails me back a spreadsheet that shows exactly which percentage of these sites have which attributes. Right? I'm making this up. I say if it's got 75% or more of those sites that have it, we'll make that standard. 50% more, I'm going to call that a web convention. This is the chart that shows what's standard on the internet. Took me a couple hours to produce this. The outcome? More than 100 websites, this is a fancy clicker, look, 126 websites have linked to that article. Yeah, remember, most articles, 75% of articles nobody ever links to. This one has 126. And by the way, it performs pretty well in search. It ranks right under standards.gov.usa.gov, and it ranks right above the standard setting body for the internet, the W3C. Not hard, actually, to outrank these guys. They don't, they're not very good at SEO. They don't have to be. They run the internet. They, they're, they're fine. But I put the target key phrase in my title tag, and I kind of beat these guys. The, tra the traffic isn't bad either. It's like 100 and some thousand visits to that one URL. That page is a blue shirt. Make sense? Yeah. It's got, it's keyword focused. It's attracting links. It's, and those links make my entire domain more, more authoritative, more likely to rank. Remember, I'm trying to rank for office coffee delivery. That's how I'm going to, if I don't rank for office coffee delivery, how am I going to stay in business, right? Aggregation. How much money do marketers make? I don't know, but I know where to find out. Payscale.com and Glassdoor.com have tons of data. I go to those sites. I, do, I just grab the data for seven or eight different marketing job descriptions. I got uh, 66,000 points of data. I put it on a chart. I did it again a year and a half later. I repeated this research again the other day, or my virtual assistant did. Look at the growth in marketing job descriptions. By the way, guys, I'm making this point before. You're in exactly the right session. You're in the right room today because the compensation for people that learn, that know the skills that you are learning right now, 
These are valuable skills. <laughs> if you can figure, the people who know this, I was just talking to Lynn. Lynn, can you help me hire someone, someone else who knows this? We've got a, a rock star recruiter in the room who can help us find people like this. Add these skills to your own LinkedIn profile. You know, this is exactly what's needed. Content strategists are now making more than marketing managers. Wow, that's a major change. Okay, so I don't. So every time I send that aggregated research out, I'm I'm just citing data from other sources, right? It's meta research. It's always a top performing newsletter. This is our campaign report for every email we've sent. And when the American Marketing Association calls up and says, "Hey, Andy, can we republish that article in Marketing News Magazine? We got the career issue coming up." Sure, great. There it is. When you make research, you are conjuring news. You're doing something newsworthy. You're solving that problem of how do I do something original? Yeah, quit publishing those medium quality blog posts. The world is not waiting for medium quality blog posts. No one needs that. <laughs> no one wants that. It's not useful. The survey is an even better way to produce research because you can create data that is otherwise doesn't exist at all. We answered the question, how long does it take to write a blog post? We've done that five years. I need to update this. This is year after year. We've did the, uh, we're going to start the research for it again. The answer is the average blog post, we ask 1,000 bloggers. It takes me 150 hours every year to get these, this data. I'm personally emailing everyone I know, asking them to take this 15-question survey. Very hard work. And the, but the data is interesting. I can tell you conclusively right, that the average blog post takes 40% longer to create now than it did five years ago. Three and a half hours. This is how we know this. This page, this web page, this URL is the source of that information on the internet. 1,600 websites have linked to that single piece of content, those URLs that we've updated year over year. Now, my Arabic is a little rusty, but it doesn't have to be good because they're promoting this for me all over the world. <laughs> Not weird. I know it's been translated into at least four different languages. The idea is this. It's to ask yourself in your industry, what do people frequently say but rarely support? It, this is an amazing exercise. Ask yourself, sit down, get in a room, and ask yourself, what do people in your industry frequently say but rarely support? When you figure out what that is, when you go out and create that, you have published the missing statistic in your industry. I've done this in workshops all over the place, right? I'm, I could tell you stories about fascinating things that people have concluded, data they found in their offices, right? The missing statistic. What is the missing statistic in your industry? So everyone does it, right? Nope. Only 40, according to Michelle Lynn, only 40%, 47% of companies have published original research. Why, why don't more people do it? It's because it's really, really hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. But remember, the blue shirts are so much better than the red shirts, right? This is, a crazy, this is like an even steeper curve, an exponential curve. If results are exponential, but time and effort is linear, why wouldn't you just do anything possible to be even a little bit farther over on this, on this chart? Right? Why wouldn't I work? This is what most people do, right? They're going to put in a couple hours of work to that piece of content, and they don't get results, so they just write the next one and write the next one. They're slaves to their publishing calendar. Meanwhile, there's a few of us, right, who are willing to put 15 hours into a specific piece of content, right, because they know that, you know, this, that the uh, being even a little bit, that great is so much better than good, that being even a little bit better can give you exponentially better results. This is uh, Hinge Marketing found this. High growth firms are three times as likely to publish original research as part of their content strategy. The word is out. Andy, how many questions? I've seen super long ones. People say, I know it's going to take 15 minutes, but could you answer these 55 questions, right? Trying to get me to prioritize my answers. Ours was 15 questions. 15 questions. We gave no incentive. There's no gift card. I just asked people to do it for the love, you know, do it, do it because we're friends. Just um, share it, please. If you have an audience, would you mind please sharing this? Literally, my hands would, were sore. I sent so many LinkedIn messages to so many people. It's easier now because I can delegate it because we built the list. By the way, if your survey is of content creators, your audience, you're building your audience of the content while you're gathering the data because the, re the respondents are also part of your target audience. There's a million little tricks here. I've written an article like how to promote original research, which is really a part of the game. right? Uh, it's useful to involve a media partner in that project because they're going to help you promote the survey, and then also they're going to, you know, high domain authority website, they're going to link back to it when it's done. Uh, at the end, if you'd like, I'll share uh, that article about how to promote the original research. It's a key piece. Sonia said it. I totally agree. I'm not looking for any shortcuts. I'm not giving you guys any shortcuts at all. I'm telling you all the way. <laughs> what a horrible presentation. That guy, Andy, nice guy, but he told me to work much harder. Really? Yeah, I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, 
given you any easy ways out. I'm telling you to do it much, do much more. In fact, according to that research, the, these are examples. The 27% of bloggers in our survey say that they get strong results. Only 18% of them write long-form content, but 42% who do report strong results. Only 13% of our bloggers in our survey spend six plus hours per article, but 39 of them report strong results. You see, the, what works is exactly the thing that you can't be bothered to do. Right? Publish more frequently, work with professional editors, work, collaborate with influencers, use paid promotion, adding video. But here's the bottom one, right? Create and publish original research. 58% of the bloggers in our survey who publish original research reported strong results. Great, moving on. Answering top questions of our sales page, on, our, on your sales pages. I'm getting a question, hey, your service sounds great, but I, do I need a coffee grinder, right? You're bringing me whole bean coffee. Or thanks for sending the samples, but why should I switch to whole bean, right? That sounds good, but we like our K-cups. I'm getting a consistent question during sales, and I know that because as a marketer, I'm listening in on sales calls, I'm riding along to sales meetings, right? I'm riding shotgun, and I know that these, there's common questions of people in my funnel, okay? You gotta get close to the audience. You gotta listen to them carefully. You gotta pick up the phone and actually engage with them. Pick up the mouse and start talking to them. And then, this is obviously just my son, but uh, I love that. He's sort of pretending to call on the phone. He hangs up the mouse and he goes back to work. I know, what a cute kid, <laughs> pretending to be dad. And so the public here, by the way, is a great source of these. Look, 199 questions about coffee. Have you answered these questions yet in your content? So yes, you need to answer that question in your content. The life-changing benefits of whole bean fresh ground coffee. So when people ask you that, the whole sales team is united in their messaging. And when that thing goes live, you can actually email them the, the, the response so they can share it with other people. This is how it works. Prospect asks question, salesperson answers question. Marketing person steals the salesperson's laptop, looks at their sent mail folder, finds all the important topics, you don't have to steal a laptop, but you get the idea. Then they turn that into content, they update that sales page, so the next, the next visitor to that sales page is gonna be warmer than the one before. So the idea is to, ask, to, to understand this. What questions does your audience always ask before they purchase? Anyone heard of a, a oh, and I did this, I was just up the street. I was at Erickson Institute, we built their website, early childhood education, master's degrees. I'm meeting a big group of admissions officers in this room. Hey guys, what do people always ask before they apply? I couldn't write down the, the questions fast enough. How could I have ever built that website without having understood that first? You don't even know what you're writing about, what to talk about, what, to, what should go in your content strategy until you have done this first. Gotta get close to the audience. So what are the questions people always ask before they buy? Anyone heard of HubSpot? Everybody. Anyone heard of Joel Kletke? Nobody, yes, good, wow. You, there's a few people here, my, my, my tribe. Joel Kletke is not famous, but he should be because Joel Kletke doubled the conversion rates at HubSpot. How many millions of dollars was that worth? Rewrote their sales pages and doubled the conversion rates at HubSpot. How, here he is. How did he do it? He did it by calling a bunch of HubSpot customers and asking these questions. What was happening in your business that sent you looking for a solution? What else did you try and what didn't you love about it? What almost kept you from buying from us? What made you confident enough to give us a try? What made this the best solution for you? What, when evaluating options, what was the most important thing? Prioritization, right? You know how to write this. What can you do now that you couldn't do before? Gathering testimonials. Give me an example of when this made a difference for you. Case studies. You can just imagine how valuable this would be. How much better would your sales pages be if you talked to 10 customers, asked these questions? The genius of Joel actually was not to go use this and go take this data and go write something. He used their words. The target audience wrote the sales pages. He, this was a way for him to gather that information. Because, what ha because this is the science of conversion, right? There's two skills that I hope my children have, SEO and CRO, search optimization and conversion optimization. Be a dual threat marketer. They know cheese, they know mouse traps. they're gonna be rich. That's the game, got it? This is the conversion side. Question, the audience has questions, we answer their questions, we support their answers with evidence, right? They're supporting the answers. So we give them clear specific calls to action, that's the game. Joel's point is that we get stuck behind our screens, we start talking about things and writing about things that people don't actually care about. Okay, so I know my answers now, I know the important topics, but I'm not satisfied to leave it all as text. I'm gonna upgrade my content to visual formats. Don't leave it as text. Upgrade your content to visual formats. So here's my, this is all fake of course, this is a, just a, example. 
the SmackDown, the whole bean ground coffee SmackDown, the flavor, the price, the, all the whatever, you know, this is my, my research report, reformatted as that, because I know that text is, in fact, sadly, the weakest format for content. Articles, guides, and ebooks, that's fine. Images are more visually compelling, have more power to stop the visitor, right? Infographics, diagrams, and means, but videos are even more powerful than that. This is the law of visual hierarchy. This is not a subjective thing. This is like a cognitive bias built into all of our brains. Every web page on the internet has a visual hierarchy, whether it was created deliberately or not. Go look at the, every scroll depth at every web page is a visual hierarchy. Does your website deliberately guide? It's mind control. It's a giant Jedi mind trick, web design. You're guiding the visitor's eyes through the most important messages where they see what they wanted, what they were looking for and where they found what you wanted them to find. Answers and evidence. Answer, evidence, answer, evidence. Call to action. So here's the, we'll share the slides. I don't have to read this all. But these are literally the rules of visual hierarchy. This determines what people are looking at on your web pages. It's sometimes predictable. It's sometimes not. Night tracking study, heat mapping, hot jar, there's tools that would show you this. And it's critically important, right? He knows it. Eli is very good at visual content. Putting it on the garage, he's just taking it all over the place. <laughs> I get home, I was, at a, I was teaching it, I was giving a web shot, uh, workshop in Wichita, Kansas yesterday. I get home, there's like blue crayon all over the wall. My wife gave him crayons, they're like bathtub crayons. They're like, you can use these to draw on the wall. Yeah, you can draw on tile. Yeah, there's like blue, there's artwork all over the kitchen wall now. I know. I don't know. I hope it, I hope it washes off. Let's, this always works. This is a guaranteed formula. I've never seen it fail. Turn your top X into Y. This is almost the purpose of analytics is to find those outperformers. Larry Kim says that everything that you've ever done is either a unicorn or a donkey, right? It's the, it's the blue shirt or the red shirt. Find the blue shirts, right, and turn those into something else. Turn your top blog post in an infographic. Definitely going to succeed. 100%. I, <laughs> call me if it doesn't. Turn your top blog post into a video. Turn your top three articles into a guide. Definitely going to, it's almost automatic, right? Success is um, almost automatic. Turn your top Facebook post. This is, I think, one of the best uses of social media is to see, is to see which of your headlines were most effective. Now you can use those as subject lines in email. Social is kind of a low stakes format, right? It's data rich, but not expensive. You just put stuff out there and see what people engage with. Email, tough. Email's really tricky, right? I get stressed out trying to come up with a good subject line. You can't unsend that email. So yeah, here's an idea. Put all of your possible head e email subject lines into social and see which one performed best. Use that as the next subject line for your next email. Yeah, so this is Larry Kim's point. You know, the goal is to find unicorns and then go make baby unicorns. It's worth that slide just to say baby unicorns. That's like an automatic hit. Here, uh, here's my, how I prior I would recommend all of you guys prioritizing. Really, like repurposing your high-performing content is going to get you better results than creating new content. Creating more visually compelling formats like videos and images and presentations is going to be more effective for you than creating a new article. Writing articles is, by the way, always better a better thing to do, more important but less urgent than just opening your inbox. Something dies every morning when you open your inbox, right? Maybe we should be creating good content before we start, right? Open that inbox. Do something important before you do something urgent. Do something important before you do something urgent. Write something that's going to live for years on the internet before you start responding to, to people online. But, but hey, let's admit it, right? Responding to emails is definitely better than scrolling through Facebook and Instagram. Want to be more productive? Delete. Who didn't like apps? Delete Facebook and Instagram from your phone. Yeah, that's gonna, you're going to be more effective and productive that day as soon as you take Facebook off your phone. That's a creepy website. I'm not a... I can say that I'm a B2B marketer, so I, I, I have that luxury. <laughs> but speaking of search and social, I'm a bit obsessed with this topic, search versus social. It's part of the skill of a content strategist to look at any topic, look at any headline, look at any value proposition or service offering, and be able to tell if that's going to have a natural advantage in search versus social. Here's examples. Long form text, of course, tends to do better in search. Compelling visuals, going to do better in social. Answering people's questions works better in search, but triggering people's emotions work better in social. Because the job in search is to meet visitors' expectations. You're solving for X. They have an information need, and your job, you're, you're trying to solve for their information needs, right? But what works in social is to be a little bit unexpected. It's, they're totally different, right? We just heard about mobile targeting. Totally opposite. In search, you know everything about what they're thinking, but nothing about who they are. In social, you know nothing about what they're thinking, but everything about who they are. Innovative companies that invented something new, no one's looking for you. 
Try social, try paid social, right? Other things like, uh, I don't know, you know, emergency plumbing. How do you target that in social media? Perfect for search, right? That, that's an urgency need. The difference is people in search are busy and people in social are bored. <laughs> Nobody goes to social media with a plan. They're waiting for the bus, right? It's like no one's, the, that's, this is a important, this is a big distinction and I'm kind of obsessed with this topic. I love to look at it. I think about a topic or a headline, you see things like that, you can tell almost immediately where that thing is gonna have a natural advantage. It also brings us to our next topic which is about collaboration. Collaborating with the experts, the absolute experts is gonna give you an advantage in search. But there's social media influencers. This is like literally by my feet. I've, this is a low screen. So influencers and collaboration. Okay, who should we be, well, I'll break it all down first. This is what you want, a lead. How do you get a lead? You need two things, traffic and conversion. Traffic times your conversion rate equals leads. SEO and CRO, right? Mo cheese and mousetrap. Traffic, actually, it's not just SEO. There's three sources of traffic, classic sources of traffic in, in con content marketing. Search optimization, social media, and email marketing. But we know that search drives the visitors who are most likely to become a lead because they have intent, right? These, the conversion rates from these visitors into leads will be much, much lower. Every analytics account will show you this. So we're really talking about search, we're really talking about rankings. So why do sites rank? Two main search ranking factors, links and content, as in authority and relevance. This is the basics of SEO, right? So we get to one of the most important questions in digital, why do people link to things? Why does anybody link to things, right? Two reasons, one is it's link-worthy content. What was that? Original research. And two is you have a relationship with someone who creates links. Who creates links? Content creators. This is, uh, by the way, influencers. Collaboration with influencers was the one question that correlated most strongly with the bloggers who reported strong results across all these different promotion channels. It's a mega trend. It's not going away. So to collaborate with content creators, I'm not just looking for anybody who's relevant to whatever, an office manager. I'm going to add a word as I look for them. I'm going to add a word that indicates that they're a content creator. 1% of people create the internet. 99% of people just consume it. I'm going to find that 1% by adding a word like blogger or writer or author. I'm going to find a bunch of people who are content creators. BuzzSumo is an even better tool for this. Actually, you would choose journalists and bloggers. This is a paid tool. But you can find influencers. And it shows you not just the size of their social following, but it shows you the domain authority of the sites they write for. If that partner links to you, this is the SEO value that would be passed to you through that link, right? So this is influencer marketing specifically for SEO, for collaboration, such as contributor quotes, expert roundups, deep dive interviews. So you made that amazing piece of research. How do you make it visible to those content creators who might link back to you? Because that's gonna be the SEO benefit that's gonna help make your whole domain authoritative, which is gonna help your sales page rank for the dollar sign key phrase, the commercial intent key phrase. Here's, how, here's my trick for making sure that influencers know about your awesome research. Ready? Here's a... Um, this is the 17, I need to update this, but this is the same thing we do it year after year. It's, the, it's a consistent approach. It'd be really cool if Ann Handley knew about this research because she writes for some really high domain authority website. Oh good, I included her in it. That's handy. If Ginny Dietrich knew about this, that'd be great. I wonder if I could get Ginny to know about it. Oh good, I included her in it. I've stacked the deck. It's like cheating. That's how well it works. You don't, don't ever make something and then hope that an influencer will see it. Include the influencer in it during the creation process. A journalist wouldn't write an article without including a source. Why would you create an article without getting a contributor quote from, some, from a relevant influencer? What, today I had an article go live. It's about how images can affect your SEO. Brittany Muller is the data scientist from Moz. Anyone heard of Moz? Yeah, I emailed Brittany. Hey, Brittany, do you have any ideas on this? Sure, here's an idea. Makes your content better and gives it greater reach, right? Two bloggers, blogger A, blogger B, blogger A writes an article. Blogger B writes that article, so, uh, socializes the topic with their network. Is this a good headline? Should I write about this? What do you, who would I wa work with on this? And then you include people in the article, right? They're in the article. These two articles go live. Which do you think gets greater social traction? Which do you think gets greater reach? Right, it's not even close. The blue shirt. I should change the colors in here, right? I should really go with that soccer theme and just go with that all the way. So yeah, I get this, oh, this was from Digital Megaphone. This is last year. I get these emails after, after these events. Wow, that worked great. <laughs> I love taking these screenshots. Andy, I tried that and it worked great. Not surprising because an ally in creating content is an ally in promoting that content. You just haven't really optimized your content for social unless you've included people in it. Yet, 
blogger after blogger, content strategists and content marketers just keep publishing stuff. Single, it's almost like this. Think of it this way. This is um, the, blunt, the, the brutal way to say this is we are past the era of single POV content. That's kind of over. You need multiple points of view in your content or you are at a disadvantage because you're up against guys like us, right? The other people in this room who are already, who are already doing this. So everybody does it, right? Nope, only 15%. Only 50% of B2B brands have ongoing influencer marketing campaigns. And now we get to the other piece, the offsite piece, writing for other sites. This is the red shirt guy, blogger A, writes two pieces of content. Blogger B pitches an article to an editor, gets an article from a contributor. They've got more content associated with their brand. There's a link coming back to their website. They've got better friends. Round two, links, connections, social media. Round four, nice blog, buddy, but this is the future of digital. This is what marketing should look like. One difference, collaboration. It's a collaborative mindset. And this offsite publishing does wonders for your search. You're literally creating links on the internet. Now I'm going to show you the best pitch that I've seen. There's some PR pros. Carolyn's right here. This is one of the best pitches I've seen in, in modern digital. This is blogger relations, influencer marketing, digital PR. Aaron Orendorf, nobody knew his name three years ago. And then suddenly this guy started writing this amazing, super detailed, high quality, long form content for the biggest publications on the internet. Like, who is this guy? I really want to get to know him. If, you know Aaron? Have you seen this? Yeah. Th I'm going to show you now Aaron's pitch. He lovingly crafts a, just a, a, a super detailed article aligned with their formatting, their headline styles, their internal linking, their images, paragraphs, length, bullet points, pitches it to super high level uh, publications with this email. I wrote an article for you. Here it is. This is working really well in PR because it solves a big problem for the editors. The editors are getting like 100 pitches a day. They do not want to get another, like go back and forth with you for three weeks about a headline. I wrote an article for you, here it is. They made it, Aaron makes it a no work proposition for the publication that it can just say yes, thank you. Yeah, huge hits, came out of no, like he's just a mega brand now. The guy, I think he's like chief, strat, chief content strategist for Shopify. Aaron's doing great. So everyone, so we all do this, right? All brands are doing this? Nope. Only 65% ever guest post. A third of bloggers aren't even ever writing for other websites. Right? You can see the gap. It's big. Most people just write for their own site. Just keep churning out medium quality articles for their same site over and over and over. I, I told you 11 years I've written 300 and this is, it's now 380 articles I've written in my career. Spreadsheet shows them all. A third of them are guest posts. I don't think anyone's brand is too big. There's never a point at which I would ever recommend anybody ever, ever stopping this, right? Influencer marketing is about writing, is about borrowing the audience of that company or brand that's already captured them, exactly the people you want to reach. Borrowing that audience in a sensitive and considerate way. That's exactly what guest blogging is. So bottom line, if you're not making friends, I think it this way, even in this room, I hope you guys are going to get a drink afterwards, stay friends with each other, reach out to each other, let's make stuff together. Right? Extremely effective. So now I'm going to put it all together for you. Let's do this. I'm going to drive leads. I know what I'm talking about. I know the formats. I know the collaborators I'm going to work with or the content creators. I know who I'm going to write for. Those are the host blogs. It's all based on this nucleus, this core, the sales page. It's keyword focused, office coffee delivery. It's answering questions. Joel Kletke told me how to understand my audience. I'm answering all their tough questions, also known as addressing their objections. I'm supporting my answers with evidence and testimonials, which I also gathered during that process. And I've got clear, compelling calls to action on that page. Do, am I going to rank for this page? Okay, this is not an SEO presentation, but Maz is showing me that the general difficulty for that key phrase is like a 22. The general authority of my website is like a 16. Uh, probably not going to work out for me. I don't have sufficient authority to rank for that key phrase. But fortunately, my content strategy is designed around links and authority, original research and influencers, so I'm, I'm confident that eventually I'll get there. So my, my research, I'm going to make it the top office perks of the top 50 workplaces. The Tribune's got a list of top 50 workplaces. I'm going to call 50 different HR managers, ask them what perks they offer. It's going to be a lot of work, but I'm putting together this big thing. It's got charts and data. I'm going to get influencer quotes from top HR people, from some journalists who write about the topic, you know, watching the trend. If you're into it, the, the HubSpot style gated content, right? You can give me your email address, and we'll give you the full guide down here. I'm going to write the how-to article now because I'm ready for that, right? How to, how to retain your top employees. Now I'm going to write the how not to article. I call that the evil twin. Very easy to write. If you wrote the how to article, the how not to article is like half written. You know, it's like the mistakes. You wrote best practices, now go write the mistakes article. Editors love it. 
they're, it makes a great pitch, right? How to lose your top employee in 30 days. That was supposed to be a cultural reference to a movie, but that's the wrong. Isn't it like 10 days? 10 days. You get the idea. OK, I made this up. By the way, this entire strategy I'm showing you, by far the hardest part was making these dots and arrows. That stuff over there was like an hour of work to make the strategy. These dots were really hard. I had a lot of, I struggled with this. But OK, so five, five mistakes of rookie office managers. You can steal this. Steal all these ideas, please. Infographic. I've got my, my amazing piece of, con of, of research. I'm going to repurpose that as an infographic. Design charts, stats. It's got a short article with it. It links back to the anchor piece. Also makes a great pitch to a publication. I've been building relationships. Maybe someone who is included in the piece. I'm going to write about, I'm going to offer them, you know, hey, here's, you know, it's the scoop. It's going to come out. I'm going to give this to you right after it goes live. Publish it on a high domain authority website. That's going to link back, passing domain authority back to me. This is a link magnet, and I'm seeding that with this. In, with uh, guest posting, writing for other websites. Yellow is off-site content. Blue is content marketing content. Red is the sales page. Influencers, right? I'm going to find an influencer. I'm going to do a deep dive interview with them. What's, uh, just to get all the insights out of their brain, we're going to get all kinds of uh, new advice. They're going to get their feedback on the research. And I'm going to pitch myself as an influencer to maybe a, another website or a podcast. Awesome white space, right? Great blue ocean strategy. Pitch to, if you've got an executive who wants press, Pitch them to podcasts. Podcasts almost never get pitched. Really, really easy wins. Podcasters are like sitting right now all over the country. This podcaster's like, oh, who am I going to talk to next week? Oh, someone just contacted us. They got research? Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you. We'd love to have you on my show. And of course, the show notes link back to podcast show note link building. You should like patent that. Blog post one. I'm just gonna now. I'm just gonna start right. I wasn't even thinking of this as a blogging strategy, but yeah, of course we're gonna write some blog posts, right? Five workplace secrets inside the top offices. Coffee, tea, or beer. What are they drinking in top offices? Linking back to like some kind of you know beverage trend that I'm learning about, or the dirt on dishes. Oh, they got a service. You know, it's, it's relevant to my to my big piece of research. So basically, I'm gonna review this whole strategy with you now. This is. I'm gonna try to summarize it. The idea is to create high quality original content, especially research, in collaboration with content creators who are our relevant influencers, which drive enough links, which create enough authority so that our search optimized products and service pages rank for the transactional commercial intent dollar sign key phrase, which should attract visitors, qualified visitors, targeted visitors to our our sales pages, which are informative, answer questions, and build trust through testimonials so that we generate new leads every day. That's, a, that's the content strategy. Please don't share this. They'll think a lawyer was giving this presentation, but I put it all on one slide, which you can, of course, you can have it. I, I, it's, that, that's like bad PowerPoint, so people are going to think that I'm a jerk if, you, <laughs> if they see that I made that. But that's the idea, right? That's the idea. I'm putting it all together. So why wouldn't people do this? This is a framework. There's a content strategy framework that has off-site publishing. It has visual formats. It has influencer marketing. It's based on a search-optimized sales page that's anchored in research, right? So it's just not that common that people do all these things. Could you do it? Yes. How often could you do it? As often as you want. Could you do that quarterly? Sure. I could do that once a quarter. With one full-time person, I could probably pull that off quarterly. Maybe every four, six, six months at the later, right, if, if we're slow. So suppose, so remember, I'm trying to make money here. I can't put links and shares and followers in the bank. I'm trying to rank for office coffee delivery service because the day I rank for that, I'm going to get consistent quality visitors. If I can convert those visitors, I've got leads every day, right? I have leads every day. That's my goal. So uh, the, the keyword difficulty is 22 because the other high-ranking sites have lots of links to them. Looks like the other high-ranking sites for this page have like between 100 and 200 links to those, to those websites. It's SEO, right? Sites with lots of links to them have high authority. Authority is an important search ranking factor. How many links do I have to my site? Just 42. OK, suppose I, every time I do this, every round of this content strategy, 25 new websites link to me. I started with 42. I need to get between 100 and 200. At what point will I have sufficient authority to rank for that target commercial intent key phrase? I'll be right in here somewhere. I am totally confident that I could win that battle. I'm not worried at all. I'm pretty sure that with this content strategy, 
And that approach, that comprehensive approach to offsite publishing, influencer collaboration, original research, none of these other guys are doing that, right? Office coffee delivery, that's like a sleepy industry. There's nobody else like me. We're gonna crush it in there. Definitely, I think right around this time, I'm gonna rank for that, for that phrase, as long as I've got a high converting page, high converting website, right? Victory. So the idea, only 28% have, have uh, mission statements. Only 47% have anchored their content in research. Only 15% are powered by influencers and only 65% ever publish content for other websites. So here's the math. 0.28 times 0.47 times 0.15 times 0.65 is 1.28%. If that, maybe 1% of, of content programs include all these different strategies, right? Would I be in the top 1%? Could I win for that phrase? Would I have a steady stream of qualified visitors? Absolutely. Absolutely. Only 1% of them, right? Only 1% of us are mission-driven, research-anchored, influencer-powered, and PR-focused. 99% of people didn't come to this presentation, a digital megaphone. We're going to crush those guys. They got no chance at all. I love it. It's competitive. Okay. Everything we just talked about, I remember to add this, is in a, I made a video and an article that outlines this whole thing. So I know there was a bunch of stuff. You don't really have to take notes. If you wanted to, you can just go to that address. It's at slash blog slash content strategy framework. Or it's a search optimized thing. Just go search for content strategy framework and you'll find that article right there. You can just pull out your phone and search for that and then read it later. You can find it or read the article. That's what I got. Thanks, guys. <laughs>